Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar session on Governance Matters Organizing for Success. My name is Ian Fegley. I'm the Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the Forum for Youth Investment. The Forum is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan action tank that combines thought leadership on youth development, youth policy, cross system and cross sector partnerships, and developmental youth practice with on the ground training, technical assistance, and supports. Today's session is on out of school time, or OST for short systems which are a promising strategy to improve access to quality expanded learning opportunities for, for more youth. A key lesson learned from the Walls Foundation's investment in OST system building is that coordination needs to match the local context and that governance really does matter for system su success. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Priscilla Little, Big Picture Approach Consultant with the Forum, Sharon Deitch, who will also be joined by Eric Skold of Sprockets in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Angie Ditzler of Blocks in Louisville, Kentucky. The, today's session is being recorded. Oh, let me move to that logistics slide. Today's session is being recorded and will be sent to all of you as soon as it is, as it is posted. All lines are gonna be muted throughout the session to avoid any background noise, so please submit your questions using the chat feature. If you are a tweeter, uh, please follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag ReadyU. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Priscilla Little, who is a BPA consultant. She's been working in the education arena and conducting educational research for over 20 years. She is a member of the Forum for Youth Investments Big Picture Approach Consulting Group, building its capacity to support multi-site strategic alignment and partnership initiatives, including the Performance Partnership Pilot. Prior to becoming a consultant, she was at the Harvard Family Research Project, where she led research teams to investigate policy re relevant after school issues, such as improving participation, addressing program quality, building after school systems, and supporting expanded learning partnerships. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Priscilla. Thanks, Ian, and we can go to the next slide if you'd like. Um, again, welcome to our conversation about out of school time system governance structures. I want to open by framing this conversation within a broader national landscape of out-of-school time systems. Beginning in the early 1990s, the Wallace Foundation began investing in communities to test the idea that when out-of-school time programs work together and are coordinated under common definitions of quality, collecting common data points, and forming networks, then it ultimately benefits the young people of a community. In 2003, the foundation invested in five communities, Boston, Chicago, New York, Providence, and Washington, D.C., to build out-of-school time systems. They coupled this investment with a research project that determined the five cities demonstrated a proof of principle that taking a coordinated approach to out-of-school time was indeed possible and showed promise in improving access to quality learning experiences after school and in the summer. In 2011, I was invited to join the Wallace team to manage a new initiative, investing in nine cities across the country, and we have two of those cities on the phone with us today, already with some systems work underway to work on issues related to quality improvement, getting and using reliable information. Coupled with the investments in communities themselves was a technical assistance project aimed at helping the cities with the challenges and bumps they encountered as they did their work. An unanticipated and key challenge that brings us here today is the need to reflect and revise current governance and decision-making structures. So, as the Wallace document, Growing Together, Learning Together states, coordination fits the local context. Sharon and her team were brought on board to support city's governance work. And in doing that work, both with the Wallace sites and the other communities that Four Points Education Partners works with, they, in partnership with the technical assistance team, develop the diagram you see on the screen that helps us understand and define what an out-of-school time system is and does. The diagram is fairly self-explanatory in terms of the four columns. What does, what does it do? Who is involved? What does it need? And who does it help? But those are really the generic questions that each community has to address on its own. For example, none of the systems that I've worked with, and it's now over 20, have the same vision statement. The key stakeholders vary by community, but I have to tell you, some of the strongest out-of-school time systems enjoy very strong mayoral support, not just in terms of resources, although it does help to have a dedicated line item in the city budget for out-of-school time, but more for their leadership and bully pulpit role they play in raising the visibility of after-school in general and out-of-school time systems in particular. And for those of you who want to know more about that, I suggest you check out the National League of Cities, NLC.org, 
They have a lot of resources on out-of-school time system building and the importance of mayor involvement. When it comes to system needs, there are four elements, but as the discussion today will demonstrate, different cities need different approaches to governance and decision-making structures, and I think Sharon would agree with me that how you set yourself up has implications for your communications, for your partners, and how you raise and manage resources to care for the system. Finally, the outcomes communities tackle also vary depending on how communities talk about readiness. Some elevate the role of social and emotional learning, others zoom in on health and safety. Taking their technical assistance work one step further, and because a real demand on the part of the nine cities in the next generation initiative, as well as more broadly, as a Wallace um, program initiative manager, I commissioned the four point team to do a scan of how not only the nine in the initiative had set themselves up for governance, but how others across the country were doing so as well. I'm now going to turn most of this webinar over to our three experts in system building, and we'll just put your pictures up again. Sharon Deitch, partner and vice president of Four Point, Angie Dixler, director of Youth Success Metro United Way, who's the project leader for Blocks, which is the name of the Louisville out of school time system, and Eric Skold, who's the director of Sprockets. So Sharon, to kick us off, can you explain why governance structure of an out-of-school time system really does matter to system health and success? And what did you learn in conducting the governance scan? Thanks, Priscilla. Um, and hello to everybody. Very happy to be here today. Um, so as Priscilla, as you were saying, um, we think that we know that city systems are very dynamic and complex and we know that they draw their power from the resources of community partners and the ability of city leaders to gather and focus together. We also know that this is not easy work. So there need to be some structures in place to help with everything that you we looked at on that very first chart. So just like we have, um, systems, any organization has systems in place. We have them in our homes, we have them in our schools, we have them in our organizations. We also need to have those structures in place in our out-of-school time networks. Um, what we were learning is that um, governance is often one of those things that happens but hasn't always gotten the attention that maybe it needed. It's a little bit like the plumbing in our house. When it's broken, we know we need to do something with it, but otherwise we just sort of take it take it as a, a steady state and we have what we have. But through the work that happened with the ASB grantees, we realized that when the cities were actually changing and modifying their governance structures, it helped them to accelerate progress to the goals. So we think that that's why governance matters. So we started out our work by really thinking about what do we mean by governance, the very first question there. And because of the very collaborative nature of networks, we defined governance as the basic operating structures and practices that guide the work of a city system. That governance helps around the coordination, which is central to success. Governance provides anchors in the ever-changing landscape of our communities. People come and go, but we want the work to continue, and so this is how the, the work is connected to key community organizations, is through the governance structure. And then equally as important, the governance structure establishes the roles and relationships between the partners. Who's going to do what to keep the work moving? How decisions will be made so that Everyone feels their voices are heard while, while balancing that with making some progress. How information will flow? How are we going to communicate with each other? They brought us to think about this topic so much with how our resources are managed, making sure that we have the resources we need to do the work we want to do and that we're continually looking for new resources to grow the work. Um, should we go to the next slide, please? So um, as part of the work, 
Wallace, the Wallace Foundation, as Priscilla said, she commissioned us to do some work and gave us the ability to look at the governance structures of many of the cities that were part of the um, after school system building work. And through this work, we looked at a variety of features of the out-of-school time systems, and we realized that a lot of the way cities are organized and are able to push their work forward depended upon what kind of organization acted as the home for their out-of-school time network. So we have Three, we realized there were three distinct types of or models of homes and subsequent organizations that followed them. And they include a public agency home, and this is where an organization might be housed in a mayor's office, in a school district, or in a different city agency, maybe a library or in a parks and recs department. Um, at the far right of the picture that you see, we also saw many out-of-school time networks housed in nonprofits. And we saw that some of these were single-purpose nonprofits, after school was what they did, and others were multi-service organizations of which after school was a piece of the work that they did. Um, we also found this um, new kind of organizational structure that we named a network structure, and it really is a little bit of a hybrid, but the most important feature of it is that no one organization acts as the home for the work. It's a true network in the sense that roles and responsibilities are shared across two or more organizations. So we had these three types of networks and we began to look and see what some of the, um, how strategies and operations differ in each one of these buckets. So if, if we go back to the public, public agency network again, we saw some real clear advantages for those networks that were housed in public agencies when it came to attracting partners. Public agencies have a broad span of partners that they work with on a very regular basis, and that was definitely an advantage for the network. We also saw that um, Anchor that when these that when networks were housed in public agencies that they they had solid anchors in the community and anchors that were built to weather political tr transitions. So your cabinet departments and your local agencies exist regardless of who your mayor is. So that creates an anchor in a space for um, the out of school time system as the inevitable political transitions happen. And we also see that when an, a network is housed in a public agency, that there's a ready group of staff and leaders and infrastructure in place to help support the work, uh, the whole infrastructure of whatever city agency that would be. And so there are some real benefits to being in a public agency. We also saw a group of benefits to being in the, a network structure, a structure where multiple organizations shared responsibility. And one of them was that the, um, these network structures are not very hierarchical, so that there's nobody who's in charge. It really, the OST network becomes much more of a shared organization. Um, it often that we saw in these networks that there were a wider group of decision makers involved and that they really had to rely on more collaboration. Communication is key when you are operating inside one organization. It's really key when you're constantly trying to connect people in multiple organizations. Um, when we looked at our nonprofit um, networks, we also saw some really um, important positive things and some, the infrastructure of the nonprofit was really able to help the network move forward. Um, one of the interesting things is that many nonprofits were both 
funders, and network homes. So they have a real eye on the money and financing and sustainability is something that they are able to dip their fingers in very deeply. Um, we also saw that sometimes these homes are part of a non the, the networks are in a home that's part of a multi-service nonprofit. And in that case, they can easily connect with the other services there and really begin to mesh their services with other supports and organizational structures within the community. So each one definitely has their, their benefits and we could see why depending on where, it, wh where your city is and what is available that there are a variety of different um, homes. It's also really interesting to us, and I'm going to jump a little forward here, that the homes changed over time. This was perhaps one of the most interesting things that we discovered as part of this study, and that was that governance evolves, and it evolves to meet the changing needs of the city and the network. And there are many reasons that um, a, an organ, an at a school time network might choose to change its home. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that, but from our panelists, but I think it's important to keep in mind that these are dynamic structures, even the governance is dynamic. And that um, there's really no right governance model for anybody. We can't, there's no way to say this one is the most stable or this one is the most effective. The right model really depends on the resources and leadership and um, energy in your community at the moment where you begin your work and then to have, what, are the, what are your needs over time and what structure will help you meet those needs most effectively. Priscilla, I think we can Go on from there, and maybe we can um, switch over now and hear from some of our network folks. So, so Sharon, are you ready for the next segment? I'm ready for the next segment. Is there something else you wanted? I think I think I'm ready to move. Great. Okay. So, so I'm going to start off and then Sharon, you kick in. Um, Eric, um, you're going to break up the two female voices that people have been hearing. Um, can you please describe your out-of-school time system and what does it do and who are your partners? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Priscilla, and hello, everybody. I'm excited to talk with you all today. And I'm Eric Skold. I'm the director of Sprockets, which is St. Paul's out-of-school time network. And Sprockets really works to increase access to and improve the quality of out-of-school time programs in St. Paul. Um, and we, you know, help to do, help to really support youth work across the city. One thing we try to do is to gather some of that reliable information that um, Priscilla was talking about earlier and answer at the aggregate level across the city, how are youth in St. Paul doing and how are uh, youth participating in after school? What is sort of state of after school across the city. We also do a lot of our work in um, supporting programs, and we support programs in many different ways, including, including helping them improve their program quality. Um, you know, we, we have developed shared definitions and shared beliefs about program quality and shared assessments. We help programs collect and share data with one another, both so that we can aggregate it up and tell a collective story at the city level, but also so that programs can understand better what's happening within their programs and, and work uh, on improvement. We provide a lot of uh, training and professional development uh, to support the quality of the programs, but also just to ensure that uh, you know, youth workers are equipped to do the best job that they can do. And then most recently, we've also had a real focus on social emotional learning and helping um, helping youth workers understand how their programs can best support social emotional learning. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so Sprockets is 
in the network category of what uh, Sharon described before. And we have a fairly unique structure. Uh, Sprocket is a public-private partnership, and we're a partnership between the City of St. Paul, St. Paul Public Schools, the YWCA of St. Paul, and many other community-based organizations who uh, participate in Sprocket. Um, so Sprocket, we, we say it's a public-private partnership because we have a shared staffing model. But Sprocket currently has three full-time staff. Two of them are city employees, and one of them is a, uh, an employee of the YWCA of St. Paul, who's on loan to Sprocket full-time. And that model has changed over time. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, but it's always been multiple agencies contributing staff to, to Sprocket. Sprockets is currently housed within St. Paul Public Library. Um, and we do have a dedicated city funding source that Priscilla mentioned is, and Sharon mentioned it's nice to have, and, and it is very helpful and, and, and uh, important for us to have. But we also receive significant local and uh, national philanthropic support. About a third of our budget is um, dedicated through public resources, and the rest we raise through um, private philanthropy. I also include here that Sprockets is a non-funding intermediary. Uh, we we are very much a network. Um, I think that it's important to us because we've really been um, challenged to build our network on a shared vision for young people in St. Paul and really creating resources that are really helpful and useful to programs, supporting them in their mission and their vision for their organizations. Um, rather than some other accountability measures where you're the uh, you know direct tie to their funding or other resources. Um, so we're we're very much in the in the network um, category, and I think that has informed our government our, our governance in a lot of ways, um, which I'll talk about more later. Thanks, Eric. That was really helpful. And and Angie, now turning to you in Louisville. Talk about the structure of, uh, excuse me, what your um, system looks like and who are your partners? Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share. BLOCK stands for Building Louisville's Out of School Time Coordinated System, and we are essentially a coalition of community partners like Sprockets. Um, our coalition is led by three primary partners, being our local school district our municipal government, and our local United Way. Um, the organizations that make up this block partnership, we all have one simple thing in common, and that is that we are all striving to improve opportunities for young people in our community. And uh, like Sprockets, we follow a shared or network governance system, which I'll get into um, a bit more uh, later on. Um, so this partnership called Blocks, we formally came together in 2012 through a charter or an agreement that was signed um, by the mayor, the superintendent of our public school system, and the former CEO of Metro United Way. Although, uh, to be honest with you, conversations and convening around out-of-school time had already been happening at our local level for many years before the charter was officially signed. Uh, over the last five years, Blocks has experienced a lot of growth. Um, we started with the three lead partners um, and 38 out-of-school time sites. And here we are five years later, and we have 104 out-of-school time sites that are part of the Blocks network, and that represents 55 different organizations. So our purpose is really threefold. Um, one is to create awareness about the important role of uh, that out-of-school time programs can play in college and career readiness. The second one is to uh, rise the tide, so to speak, on program quality across the city. And then last, we really feel that Blocks is uniquely positioned to create opportunities for OSP programs to work together collaboratively on shared goals and shared messaging as well. If you can turn to the next slide, please. In 2016, Blocks uh, developed a sustainability plan, and that sustainability plan clearly articulated four main focus areas. The first one is program quality. We have a goal here at Blocks to make Louisville out of school time programs the best of the best. I mean, we really want our Blocks network to be a model of excellence in the country. Number two, we have a goal around data. Uh, one thing that we recognize here locally is that each partner 
uh, sort of owns their own piece of the data puzzle, so to speak, and that we really need to be sharing our data with one another and working together to connect those data pieces to tell the story and to prove impact. The third goal is around access and participation. We want to make sure that all young people, regardless of where they live, have access to quality OSP. And then last but not least, outreach and advocacy. Uh, Blocks is in a, is, is in a unique spot. Um, we feel like we can both speak on behalf of low capacity programs, but also speak on behalf of the sector as a whole about the important role that OSP plays in the lives of young people. Next slide. In, in 2017, we issued our first comprehensive data report, which covered three years worth of data. And that, that data report is built around this theory of change. So what you're looking at in front of you is our block logic model. And um, what this is, is it's our starting point. Um, this kind of tells where, we, where we're starting and what it is that we're, the story that we're trying to tell. And it essentially comes down to this. We feel that the more time young people spend in high quality OST, the greater the impact. And so we measure impact in a couple different ways, through academics and through social emotional learning. And I'm not going to get into details about the indicators that we use um, to measure that impact. Um, but the, the big thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that this logic model is the nucleus of everything that we do in BLOCK. All of our work, meaning our strategies, our communications, our data collection, our fundraising efforts, and even our governance structure align with this logic model. So this is our starting point. Thank you, Angie. That was incredibly helpful. And thank you, Eric, too. Now that you've gotten us a little bit introduced to your um, o OST system, can you tell us a little bit about what the governance structures look like and how they have evolved over time to meet the changing needs of your growing out-of-school time networks? How about if we start with you, Eric? Sure. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, operating as a network has informed our government. And one way that it has done that, as you can see by this slide, we have a lot of different groups um, who contribute to Sprockets. Um, the first group we have, so we have neighbor, what we call neighborhood network teams, which are geographic based uh, youth worker meetings where people can come together to think about how they align resources, share information. Um, talk about you know important uh, research or, or issues of the day and although not a form, formal piece of the government governance they definitely do a lot of informing of sprockets practice and, and uh, serve as a great place for us to hear um, different things that are needed within the community um, as I mentioned before we have a staff team that includes uh, members of different um, organizations including the city and the YWA of Saint, YWCA of St. Paul um, we also have a community advisory council, which is meant to provide a sort of program provider, program management level feedback on Sprockets initiatives and strategies. And this group meets every month and um, is really meant to provide practice-based feedback on the different strategies that Sprockets is pursuing, especially those around um, supporting quality, um, creating a vibrant network, um, supporting program improvement and data, and um, you know, represents a, a wide variety of organizations and perspectives um, to really get that program level feedback. Then Sprockets also has a leadership group, which is the most close equivalent to our board. It sets the high level vision strat and strategy for Sprockets. It helps connect us to the resources we need, you know, provide strategic direction, um, but also helps to advocate for Sprockets. Uh, in different important places, both around fundraising, policy, and other things. Um, it's been appointed by the superintendent and, and mayor and uh, sort of serves to that highest level of leadership. And additionally, we also have the Youth Commission, um, which is uh, St. Paul's opportunity for young people to give feedback on city policies and issues <laughs> um, and also work on some of their own projects and issues that they care about. So the Youth Commission is not 
directly connected to SPRACA since SPRACA doesn't operate it, but we often use the Youth Commission as a way to seek youth input, collaborate with them on different projects that they care about, but also, also different projects that we care about and uh, get another sort of youth perspective on the work of SPRACA. Um, so it really creates a lot of groups and a lot of meetings, but we've used it as a strategy to build leadership at all levels. So, you know, really trying to rally people around a shared vision for St. Paul's young people, it takes a lot of different voices and a lot of different um, people in the room. So we have created intentionally a lot of tables where people can come together to talk about how we can best support young people in St. Paul. And that includes everything from frontline youth workers to the mayor and the superintendent. And so it's been a real intentional strategy to create a lot of these tables. It does take a lot of staff time to support and maintain them and, and make sure that those meetings are meaningful and engaging, but it also really helps us engage many different people across the community and make sure that uh, Sprockets has a lot of support and a lot of energy and creativity. Our governance structure has changed significantly over time and actually, um, surprisingly, there were even more gears or groups um, at, at different times in the past. Um, when Sprockets first started, it was actually a commission um, appointed by the mayor that was sort of charged with thinking about how uh, after-school programs could best be supported in the city. Originally, that commission recommended the creation of Sprockets as a nonprofit. That was around 2010 and at a time when the economy wasn't really strong and then the mayor eventually decided that he didn't think there was a, enough support or room for another nonprofit in um, in St. Paul. So th we ended up creating this public-private partnership that exists now. Um, but in order to support that public-private partnership, we, we actually still had a leadership group and a community advisory council, but we also had an operations team in addition to those groups, which included high-level managers from the city, school district, and the partnering organizations, which back then included the YWCA and Augsburg College. And so that group really meant, um, met regularly and helped think about how some of the strategies of SPRACA could be implemented within their own system, but also to help oversee the staff team and, and manage the staff team. Um, at that time, the director's position was housed within the mayor's office, and supervised by the director of parks, libraries, and the mayor's education um, organizer, which created a, a really powerful management team, but also many different voices sort of helping to direct the, um, the Sprockets director, which sometimes caused confusion and, you know, differing uh, opinions, um, which was not always helpful in our governance. So. But we also, at that time, were a part of the um, Wall Next Generation Systems Building Activities, which did encourage us and help us think about a different governance model. So about two years into um, the creation of SPRACKETS, two or three years into SPRACKETS, we did do a really thorough review of our governance um, structure. And in order to do that, we did a lot of satisfaction surveys with different participants um, of SPRACKETS groups, um, including governance groups and just other people participating in practice activities. We also hired consultants to help us have a sort of independent facilitator to help us think about governance and really took a, a, a look at all the different groups and what their roles were and um, what the different options were. At that time, we were again thinking about, you know, should Sprockets become its own nonprofit, should it merge with another um, organization? or should it fall more sort of solidly within one of the existing current partners? And at that time, we actually decided that the structure was working good. Um, the feedback that we got from participants in Sprockets uh, showed a real high satisfaction with Sprockets and the work that was accomplished. Some, um, some confusion in how decisions were made and um, you know exactly what the clear lines of command were, but not dissatisfaction with those decisions themselves. Um, so we decided that we actually, that the that current structure was actually the best um, structure for us and decided to keep it. I think one of the reasons why we kept it is because it allowed us a lot of flexibility, especially around fundraising. 
Um, so having all those different partners um, included in the governance of SPRAC has helped us raise money at Augsburg College. It helped us raise money with the city itself, and it also helped us um, get grants through the Friends of the St. Paul Public Libraries. And we could kind of choose the best fiscal host for the funder that we were applying to. Um, and, and the structure just had a lot of flexibility in that it didn't include all the encumbrances of, uh, you know, that a board of a nonprofit might um, be legally accountable to. Um, but even though we decided to keep this, uh, the core of the structure in place, we also um, did, did make other changes. There was a time when our mayor was strongly considering a run for governor, and at that time he moved. For that reason and, and other reasons, moved the director's position into the Office of, of Parks and Recreation. Um, and so the director was then a, officially a parks employee, but still supervised by um, three separate people, including the director of parks, libraries, the mayor's office employee. And then finally, when I became director about two and a half years ago, um, the position was moved to St. Paul Public Library. I think that decision was made again to think about um, insulating the position from political change but also to find uh, a supervisor that was going to best support Sprocket. And at that time the director of the library had a lot of experience relevant uh, to supporting Sprocket and, and was a really uh, dedicated Sprocket leader and so at that time we really made the shift to one uh, supervisor for the Sprocket position which I am grateful for um, and so my my supervisor now continues to be um, the director of libraries, but I also still work with all the groups you see on the slide to think about um, the governance of, Stark, of Sprocket. And at the time I became director too, we also did a, a re-scan of the governance you know, and, and really looked at what was the best structure for Sprocket that clarified the roles and created new charters for each of the groups to make sure that everything was really clear and that people understood what the group's role was and how they could best support SPAC. Thank you, Eric. That was such a great description of what we know was years and years of work and many changes. So thank you for distilling it so well and sharing that with us in that in that way. And we'll we'll get to have some more conversation about all of this after we also hear from Angie and she tells us a little bit about the the governance road that was taken in Louisville. Yes, absolutely. So uh, similar to Sprocket, um, like I mentioned before, Blocks is a shared or network governance model, meaning that we do not have a single intermediary, uh, nor does Blocks have its own 501c3. You know, we are truly a coalition of partners and all of the responsibilities are shared among those three core partners. So, for example, our local school district is the lead on all things data. So they are collecting all the data, analyzing the data, taking the lead on our annual data report, and they are also the lead on our summer learning uh, work. Our metro government, uh, they have a dedicated funding stream now, so they're providing uh, direct funding both to OSC programs and to the block's infrastructure. And in addition, they are our uh, lead partner on all things training and professional development um, for out-of-school time workers. And Metro United Way also has a dedicated funding stream, um, and we are the primary project management lead. So uh, we provide the financial oversight, and we also are the lead on all of the block's program quality strategies. Um, what I think is uh, interesting uh, in the last year is that this past year, 2018, was the first year that Blocks uh, had dedicated staff who were hired within the lead institution, but these individuals, um, their sole responsibilities are dedicated to Blocks. And prior to 2018, um, the core partners used existing staff to share and take on those Blocks responsibilities in addition to their day-to-day job responsibilities to their employer. So a little bit about the hierarchy and the structure that you see in front of you, and I'm actually gonna start in the middle of, um, of this structure and go in chronological order. So Blocks is, in essence, uh, led by an operations team. And this committee 
um, was uh, originally called an executive leadership team, and it was a fairly narrow and exclusive group of individuals. And over the, over the last couple of years, we've broadened our membership base. Um, this group handles the day-to-day -day operations, and they meet monthly. Uh, in fact, we had our block operations team meeting this morning. And um, the great thing about this group is that we have uh, OSP provider representation now at this level, which we didn't have prior to 2016. In addition to having a couple OSP providers on the operations team itself, we have also formed a group um, called, we call it the OSP Provider Network or the OSP Provider PLC, Professional Learning Community. And that's where all of our providers come together monthly and they provide input into our block strategies and it also gives them a venue to talk and collaborate and learn from one another. Below the operations team is our subcommittee, or we call them our working group level. And this is where we have, um, a, we have many more community and OSP partners engaged at this level. So a lot of the details um, are worked out and plans are devised and implemented within our work group. Um, so for example, right now we have two work groups that are um, meeting currently. We have a data report um, that's coming out in February, and so we have a, a a work group that is working really hard on getting that data report ready. Um, we also have a work group um, that is gearing up for our summer learning initiative. So these are ad hoc groups that have um, a defined uh, time frame and very specific deliverables. And once those deliverables are met, um, the work group ends. Um, and then I'm going to circle back up to the top layer. Louisville Promise. So this is, this is interesting. Louisville Promise is a brand new overarching organization that is new on the scene in Louisville. And the best way I can describe it to you is that all of the community leaders, um, influencers, important folks in our city, um, anybody who you need to know is, is either on the board or on the operations committee um, of Louisville Promise. And so this organization has um, Two goals. One is to create a universal scholarship for post-secondary ed. And then their second goal, um, which is really aligned with blocks, is that they want to ensure a network of support early on for young people so that those young people can successfully take advantage of this post-secondary scholarship. And because its mission is so aligned with blocks, uh, blocks was asked to kind of slide in as one of Louisville Promise's first work groups. So for now, BLOCKS is still an autonomous coalition, um, but what we are learning um, is that working as a partner with Louisville Promise seems only natural because Louisville Promise has access to resources and influencers that BLOCKS needs, and BLOCKS is already doing exactly what Louisville Promise had identified as one of its first focal points, and that is out-of-school time programming and summer learning. So just to hit on a few things um, about how our structure has changed over the years. Um, first of all, I would say that in the early days, we jumped to form before function. We had, uh, you know, going back five years ago, we had a lot of committees and subcommittees. Um, I, I think at one point we had four subcommittees um, plus two additional committee levels above that in the hierarchy. And suffice it to say, it was confusing. Um, especially because in those early days, we didn't have a clearly defined strategic plan like we do now. Um, you know, I mentioned that original charter that was signed back in 2012, and that charter was really more of a declaration of commitment from the partners than it was a document that articulated clear roles and responsibilities of the various partners. So if I had to compare then to now, what I would tell you is that the overall structure, governance structure right now is similar, but better, a lot better. Um, you know, for example, we still have subcommittees now, although we call them work groups, but what's different is that they are ad hoc and they are not standing committees. Um, and they also include a lot of individuals who are not part of the formal standing structure of LOC. So they can come and go. And I think one of the real benefits to um, structuring our subcommittees this way is that it takes the pressure off of having to staff and support permanent committees. And it also gives us the flexibility to uh, rally around kind of the changing priorities at hand. Um, the operations team. So like I mentioned before, 
it was an executive team that has expanded into a broader operations team. And the most important thing that's changed there is that it includes providers themselves. I mean, who better to speak up for provider wants and needs than OST providers? So we've, we have formally kind of brought them into our, um, our governance structure. And we've also eliminated a mid-level, um, we called it the coordinating council, um, and that was uh, one step below the operations team. And that was because, you know, when we stepped back and we looked at our governance structure, we realized that it just didn't really seem to serve a specific purpose. And then the last thing I would say, the big takeaway about how our structure has changed, is that we have figured out how to take advantage of existing community tables and existing energy um, here in Louisville, and we've kind of figured out how to make them work for blocks, um, or maybe it's better to say how to make blocks fit with them. Um, you know, one thing about Louisville is we have a very philanthropic and collaborative community. We have over 2,200 nonprofits in the city, and most cities our size only have about 900 um, nonprofit organizations, and so we certainly are not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, we, we've done a couple things. We, we looked at an existing community table. I mentioned that network provider PLC that's part of the operations team level. That was an existing table and it was called Everyone Reads mm -hmm. up until a couple of years ago. And at that table, there were a lot of our OS providers who were already engaged in that work. And so Blocks was able to come in and create some um, structure around that group and then formally bring it into the block structure. And then similarly with Global Promise, um, a, a couple of years ago, we at, at Blocks, we were in the process of forming a higher level leadership board to kind of oversee the entire governance structure. But we stopped our plans, we halted plans because we knew that there was a lot of energy and momentum building around Louisville Promise. And there were some really important people in the city, like the mayor and the superintendent and school board members and the provost of a local university and funders. And all these people were the ones who we wanted to engage in our block structure, but they were already being tapped and pulled into this Louisville Promise. And so we waited for the right moment to be blending into that structure so that Louisville Promise can, in essence, provide some overarching guidance and leadership to block and help keep us relevant and connected. Um, the last point I'll make is, you know, why did we make the changes that we did? And I think it comes down to two things. One is better efficiency, you know, eliminate things that you don't need and that aren't serving um, a real purpose. And two, because we had a strategic plan that came out of 2016. And when we looked at that plan, what it really did is it illuminated the need to take a better take another look at our structure and restructure our governance um, you know we now have some clearly defined strategies and roles and responsibilities and that plan helped us see gaps where we needed to engage people and organizations who weren't engaged before and help us figure out a, an appropriate governance structure that best supported those strategies that we committed to that came out of that plan Thank you so much to, to all of you who've been speaking. A couple of questions have come in, one very specific one, and I believe it's for Angie. Do you partner with your local Urban League? We do. Um, our local Urban League is one of our um, organizational partners. Um, they have, I believe, four different out-of-school time program sites that are a part of our network. Thank you. And another question that's come in that I really think all three of you may be able to address is how can these city network models be applied to the state network? So I'm going to repeat it again because there was a little interference. A question to come in that actually Sharon and I talked about a lot when we were working on the Wallace Initiative is how can these city network models be applied to state networks? So I, I might take a, a stab at starting to answer that. Um, so a lot of our program quality strategies that we're doing, um, my understanding is that there are not just local networks that are doing the program quality work that we're doing, but there are statewide networks that are doing this. And, you know, as a future goal, we have been discussing in Louisville about our ability to go statewide. Um, and in fact, there is a, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure whether to call it a statewide network in Kentucky, but there is a Kentucky Out of School Time Alliance um, that currently exists. Now, their, their purpose and their function is different than blocks, but I think that there is an opportunity in the future for us to work together to specifically expand our program quality work um, to a statewide level. Sharon or Eric, do you want to jump in on the question of how can these models be applied and really be a model for the state networks? Um, well, I, I can just add, oh, thank you, Sharon. Sorry, I, I would just add maybe I, I think that it, city networks and state networks working together is a really important piece of us building power for the field. And so I, I know that's not exactly the question, but it's something we've been very interested here in Minnesota, and I know that other networks are working on. And I think my work with our state network has just shown that, you know, when you're trying to cover a, a larger geography, a geography to, uh, the size of a, of a state, you know, setting up different network type models are really important. And so having a, I think having a less centralized governance is really important for those in order to be able to truly cover a large geography and that broad number of stakeholders. And uh, Sharon, I, did you I, want to jump in? Sure. So uh, I I agree with um, what Eric and Angie were saying, and I think that at some level, a statewide network can also think about these different buckets and how and uh, how they organize themselves. But um, just like all of the local networks are different and really based on the needs, their local needs, the state networks are the same way and that depending on the kinds of organizations and the geography in your state, um, this typology may be more or less helpful. And I do think we, I think it's helpful to, in thinking about governance at the statewide net, state level too, but would need to be tweaked a little bit to meet the needs of the statewide networks. Thanks. And another question's come in um, around how formal is your relationship with nonprofit partners? And this is a question that we get asked a lot is, do we need, can we have a handshake? Do we need an MOU? Do we need to be baked into our governance structure? So, for Eric, I'm going to start with you. How formal is your relationship with the nonprofit partners, and how do you typically leverage that connection to increase funding for all partners? Um, I, you know, I would say that the formality depends on the type of relationship that we have with that partner. So our relationship with the YWCA, who provides staffing, is more formal and laid out in contracts. And then there are other uh, nonprofit partners who um, participate in brackets in, in, in much uh, different ways that, uh, you know, are just sort of as named partnerships that we have certain requirements around. Um, but, you know, we do try to uh, leverage connections to increase funding for all partners. I mean, I think one thing we do is we try to always work with our partners to advocate for funding that is supportive of after school policies, that is supportive of increasing funding for after school. And we also work with our partners on collaborative grant proposals or um, writing letters of support for nonprofits and others. And so, you know, as, and, and oftentimes that, that's initiated, initiated by the nonprofit itself. And then we, we sort of figure out what the best supportive relationship we can play is. Um, but really the, the formality varies depending on the level of, of engagement and partnership. Thanks. Angie, anything to build on that? Yes. Yeah, so in Louisville, we have formal partnerships in place now. We have a formal uh, MOU between Metro United Way, Metro Government, and our local school district that clearly lays out uh, responsibilities and commitments to one another. In addition, we have rolled out formal commitments. We call it our blocks agreement with each of our participating out-of-school time provider organizations. And we, um, they have to sign the agreement and commit to some best practices around quality and social emotional learning and data collection um, in order to formally be brought into the partnership. 
In addition, we've rolled out external coaching as something that um, our programs can opt into. And uh, in order to receive a coach at their out-of-school time site, we also, um, we also ask that those programs sign a coaching agreement. So we have found, um, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but it, this has been um, a, definitely yeah. a good thing for us to implement some formal agreements um, in a lot of different yeah. aspects of our network. Great, thank you. Um, and we're really almost at time, but I'd like to close, first of all, by thanking our three panelists, but then asking your, um, you for your one or maybe one and a half pieces of advice of all the things you said or haven't said that you would want to advise on a, a community either trying to build or revise their governance structure. Um, and I'm going to start with Sharon. Okay, thank you. So I, I think the that every time I listen to folks like Angie and Eric talk about their governance structures, I think the piece of advice that comes to mind is don't be afraid to think about how you can make adjustments, either big or small, to take advantage of more partners and more resources in your community. And I think both, I mean, Angie, when you were talking about the notion of linking up with the promise, the Louisville promise, it's just like it's right ahead of you. You see it, you're organizing for that success. And Eric, I know that you have done that on a, you know, you've, you've moved into an organization that could better maybe nurture you with leadership. And so really not to be afraid of the change and really to embrace it and remember that you're in a very dynamic environment and change is good. Thanks. Eric? Yeah, I would echo what Sharon just said. Every time we have revisited our structure, it has been beneficial even when we have decided not to make big changes because it helps clarify the goals and the rules of each group. And I would say also, you know, really use your governance as a way to bring more leaders and, and uh, champions into your in, into your work um, and then I really appreciated Angie's point about not always having standing committees but creating more flexible time-bound working groups that are focusing on specific projects which I think is a great strategy and something that Sprockets has been doing more lately which also gives people uh, different and more opportunities to step into leadership roles. Thank you Angie. I will offer two pieces of advice. Um, the first one is function before form all the way. It, it is absolutely worth taking the time to go through a strategic planning process first and nail down your logic model and your plans and your strategies um, and figuring out who is needed to perform those strategies before you attempt forming committees and structures. And we learned the hard way that we had some of the wrong people at the table and we're missing some of the right people. But we didn't know how to communicate to those right people um, exactly why their involvement was important. Um, and we weren't able to do that until we could point to the strategic plan and say, we need you here. Um, and then my last piece of advice is to keep pressure on at the top in a shared governance model. There can be a tendency to want to push things down the chain and I would say resist, um, keep pushing back up and use, find those channels to the top um, and use those networks to engage your top public officials. Thank you so much. You three have been really helpful and informative and we appreciate the time you took and I'm gonna turn it back to Ian to close us out. Well, thank you again to Priscilla, Sharon, Eric and Angie. We really appreciate your time and really thoughtful remarks. I wanted to mention uh, one upcoming opportunity that we have, it'll be this Friday, uh, December 14th, we'll be having a Twitter chat on the topic of readiness, equity, and quality, the prereqs for improving learning opportunities. So please join us uh, this Friday from 1 to, two, 1 to 2 to join the conversation. So again, thank you all very much. I will send the recording later this week and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.